welcome back uh, we were discussing condensers so we have started from the basic and uh, we will uh, we are slowly developing the concepts uh, <coughs> condensation on a uh, single tube we have seen now we will see on a tube bank how condensation takes place and then ultimately we will move to on the uh, design analysis of a surface condenser that is a very big uh, condenser which is almost I mean which is similar to a cell and tube heat exchanger, but there are very large number of tubes on which condensation takes place. Typical uh, condenser which are used in power plant. So, uh, the topic uh, with which I start today is uh, <coughs> design of surface condensers. So, you will slowly go to surface condenser. Uh, if you recall, we have done <coughs> we have done one problem where we have taken a single tube and over the tube there is um, uh, condensation of refrigerant vapor. So, here we are taking up another problem from the book of heat exchangers selection rating and thermal design by Shadik Kakak and co-authors. Suppose that refrigerant R134 A is condensing under quiescent condition that is almost stationary vapor on the cell side of a bundle of 41 tubes. The bundle can be configured <coughs> in a square in line arrangement which is shown in the left and uh, or in a triangular staggered arrangement which is shown to the right as shown in the figure find the average cell site co coefficient for each of the configuration. So, here all the tubes will take part in condensation, but the condensate from the uh, tube above will fall on the tube below and that will <coughs> that will thicken the condensate film of the tube below and which will diminish the rate of heat transfer. And this diminishing of this uh, effect of diminishing the rate of heat transfer is a progressive one because as we go to the tube below and below there will be more detrimental effect of film storage. So, this we have to take into consideration and average heat transfer coefficient is then uh, has to be estimated taking care of all the uh, heat transfer coefficient on the different tubes. So, let us proceed. So, initially we have determined the heat transfer coefficient of a single tube and uh, let us say uh, <coughs> let us say uh, we have got we have got the tube heat transfer coefficient which is this one this we have already calculated. Now, <coughs> this is the uh, suppose there is a row of no, sorry there is a column of tubes. So, this is the first tube this is the second tube this is the third tube fourth tube and so on. So, on the first tube it is not affected by the condensate from the top. So, we will have heat transfer coefficient h 1 which we have calculated earlier. So, this will give the heat transfer coefficient h 1 which we have calculated already we have calculated in the previous problem. Now, <coughs> later on uh, we will have lesser amount of heat transfer coefficient. Let us let us see what we have written in the inline arrangement. <coughs> Uh, in, the in, in, in the inline, the arrangement would be approximately equivalent to 7 columns of 6 tube each. This is approximate because uh, you see uh, the cell is of circular cross section. So, on all the column, the same number of tubes will not be there. So, we make an approximate and this approximation for this small problem, it looks that it is little bit um, uh, unjustified, but when we consider a very large condenser. So, then this approximation of considering average number of tubes on <coughs> in a particular column is not unjustified. 
So, this kind of um, um, uh, surface heat ex sorry surface condensers are used in power plant and already I have shown some diagram where very large number of tubes are there in a column. <coughs> And then we are using three relationships, these relationships have been described earlier. So, from Kern relationship we get what is the average heat transfer coefficient, uh, whereas the uh, heat transfer coefficient of the first tube is 1620 and um, uh, the, the uh, 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 average heat transfer coefficient is 1202. Then we use Nusselt uh, uh, relationship, Nusselt relationships gives around 1000 and then uh, there is some sort of a correlation predicted from experiment. So, that also we use and we get something around 1407. So, what we can see the Kern correlationship sorry Kern's correlation or Kern's relationship is in between the other two. So, it is always I mean it is uh, uh, many uh, many a times it is recommended that uh, we should use current correlation and we will use a, in the later problem also the current correlation or current relationship. Uh, <coughs> and current relationship what we can uh, see that uh, uh, the average heat transfer coefficient is given by the heat transfer coefficient of the topmost tube. Uh, <coughs> then uh, the number of tubes comes in two places. Uh, the 6 is the number of tube in a particular column. So, with this we get the average heat transfer coefficient. So, this is for inline arrangement. Let us go to the staggered arrangement. Assuming the condensate falls straight down and not sidewise, because you see the staggered arrangement is something like this. Uh, staggered arrangement we can get. So, this is the staggered arrangement. So, what we assume that let us say this is the staggered arrangement. So, condensate from the top tube falls on the tube below. So, it does not fall from here to here. So, this is not I mean this this does not fall from the tube on the side. So, rather it falls directly directly from the top tube to the bottom tube. So, this is the way it falls. So, if we assume that then <coughs> there are 7 columns of 3 tubes, 4 columns of 4 tubes and 2 columns of 2 tubes. So, this would be equivalent to approximately 13 columns of 3 tubes each with n is equal to 3. So, here we have made an assumption that uh, some sort of approximation we could have calculated separately also the uh, changes will not be much, but in design calculation there are many assumptions and this kind of assumption we have made that there are uh, 7 columns and approximately sorry there are 13 columns and approximately 3 tubes in each column. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> so, let me go back to uh, the previous figure, uh, then again let me go back to the previous figure, it will be. So, here I would like you to <coughs> do this calculation of your own. So, we can see this is the staggered, <coughs> this is the staggered arrangement. So, just see what we have told that there are 13 columns and approximately this, this many tubes are there. So, whether you can get from the figure out from this particular diagram or not. So, this is what I like you to do this exercise. Then there is uh, mathematical calculation, very simple mathematical calculation and just like before what we will get the <coughs> Uh, the the Nusselt correlation will give the most conservative value of average heat transfer coefficient that is the lowest value. Kern correlation or Kern relationship will be in between and the experimentally derived relationship which has been shown lastly that will give the maximum heat transfer coefficient. So, now it is up to the designer 
that what he will select. So, with this let us go to the uh, next slide. This is the end of the problem, but at the end of the problem there is certain thing to be noted. What we find that uh, when we have arranged the uh, tubes in the uh, staggered arrangement what we get? We get a higher value of average heat transfer coefficient for the tube side condensation. So, this is one thing to be noted. So, many places in practice uh, we will see that staggered layout of uh, tubes are uh, preferred compared to the inline layout of the tubes. One of the reason we can see here particularly for condensation and uh, staggered layout generally in case of um, a single phase flow it gives a better um, um, coefficient of heat transfer in case of single phase flow also. So, many cases if there are no uh, <coughs> other reason uh, people will prefer to have staggered arrangement. Staggered arrangement gives a compact design on a small design you can on a small volume you can pack up more number of tubes that is first thing. It gives higher um, uh, rate of heat transfer. Uh, that is another thing and uh, in, in case of condensation what we, we can find that it gives lesser inundation of the condensate film. So, with this message, so let us move to the next slide. Staggered arrangement of tubes yields higher average heat transfer coefficient compared to inline arrangement. So, this is the first thing. The effect of condensate inundation can be reduced, this is another way. So, what we can see the average heat transfer coefficient on surface condensation is getting reduced because of inundation of the condensate film. One way of course, is to have staggered arrangement to reduce this effect to some extent, but even we if we go for higher reduction then what we can do? We have thought of horizontal layout of the tube bundle we can go for uh, laying out the tube bundle in a slightly inclined way. So, in that way it will help into film drainage because gravity force is there. So, it will thin down the liquid film and at the same time the effect of or the detrimental effect of condensate inundation will be reduced. So, generally uh, some inclination uh, we, we cannot go for very large implication that will have other effect on the design of the condenser. So, generally within 5 degree we try to limit the inclination of the tube to get some sort of a relief from the effect of inundation. So, this problem then uh, gradually what we have seen how to calculate film condensation on a single tube and how to calculate the film condensation if there is a tube bank and there are tubes uh, in a column large number of tubes in a column. Uh, uh, another thing I like to say that in all these cases we have assumed the uh, nacelle type film condensation where there is no velocity of the vapor. This is true in many cases uh, in surface condenser particularly for power plant etcetera, we will find that the uh, vapor velocity is really very small. But where the vapor velocity is there, it will have some effect on the film and obviously, it will reduce the sorry, it will uh, modify, <coughs> it will change the heat transfer coefficient. Now, sometimes we will have a small discussion on this. Now, let us move to the next topic. With uh, our uh, knowledge of uh, single tube condensation over a single tube, condensation over a tube bank, uh, now we move to a uh, condenser where we are, uh, where the problem is more uh, rigorous and where the problem is more involved. So, this is again taken from the uh, book of heat exchanger book called heat exchangers selection rating and thermal design by Sadiq Kakak and his uh, co-authors and the problem reads like the, this, a cell and tube type condenser is to be designed for a coal fired 
power station of 200 megawatt electricity. Steam enters the turbine at 5 mega Pascal and 400 degree Celsius. Uh, I, I is denoted as uh, I is denoted um, uh, for or I is used as the symbol for enthalpy. So, I1 uh, the enthalpy value has been given which can be readily picked up from a steam table and the uh, condenser pressure is 10 kilo Pascal. So, 0 0.1 bar. Uh, so, steam enters the turbine and uh, uh, comes out at 0 0.1 bar. The thermodynamic efficiency of the turbine is 0 0.85. This is isentropic efficiency. Uh, the actual enthalpy of steam entering the condenser at 0 0.1 bar is calculated like this. So, isenthalpic sorry isentropic efficiency is given so that we know the actual enthalpy of the steam when it is entering the turbine. Uh, so, that we have got and then the condenser is to be designed without subcooling. So, in the condenser only condenser condensation takes place and <coughs> we, we, we assume that the liquid is coming out as saturated uh, the condensate is coming out as saturated liquid. A, a single tube pass is used and the cooling water velocity is assumed to be 2 meter per second. So, in the surface condenser used for steam power plant, what we do is that steam is condensed on outside the tubes and through the tube we circulate cooling water, coolant is water only. So, this I have told uh, and again I am repeating because uh, people should have uh, good idea regarding at least the basic uh, heat exchangers, very important heat exchangers for our industry. <coughs> cooling water is available at 20 degree Celsius and can exit the condenser at 30 degree Celsius. So, cooling water there will be a change in temperature, but uh, for um, uh, steam there will not be any change in temperature because subcooling is not considered over here. So, only thing is that the steam quality will change from inlet to the heat exchanger to the uh, from the inlet to the heat exchanger to the outlet and at the outlet the x value or dryness fraction will be equal to 0. <coughs> Allowable total pressure drop on tube side is 35 kilo Pascal. The tube wall thermal conductivity is given. What is the thermal conductivity? So, first what we have to do? We have to calculate the mass flow rate of the streams. So, first let us calculate the mass flow rate, mass flow rate of the vapor side, cell side or steam, the condensing steam. So, how do we find out? We know the total amount of uh, work uh, that has to be uh, extracted from the uh, that can be extracted from the turbine and we know it is a 200 megawatt uh, power plant. So, 200 megawatt will be the work done and from there enthalpy we know enthalpy of the steam entering the turbine, enthalpy, enthalpy of steam leaving the turbine we know and from there we can get the steam flow rate that is 215.68 kg per second. So, this is the steam flow rate we are getting. Uh, uh, so, basically this one the flow rate of steam. So, this is what we have got and this is a very important very basic uh, information regarding the uh, regarding the heat exchanger. So, now let us move to the next slide. Next slide, uh, let us <coughs> just have a look into the properties. Cooling water properties at mean temperature of 25 degree Celsius. You see the cooling water temperature changes at inlet it is 20 degree Celsius, at outlet it is 30 degree Celsius. So, the mean temperature will be 25 degree Celsius. At this point probably we have mentioned it and we will mention number of times that in heat exchanger 
as there is a change in temperature there could be change in property. So, due to this change in property the, uh, the heat exchanger calculation ideally becomes non-linear and which is difficult to handle. So, in many cases the non-linearity is so high that we have to handle it accurately and probably we have to go for numerical solution. In there are very large number of cases industrial example where the non-linearity is not that high and we cannot afford going for fully numerical solution. So, what we do? We go for some sort of averaging. So, here also we have averaged the liquid uh, temperature coolant side temperature 25 degree Celsius. So, we have got <coughs> we have got um, the, the specific heat, we have got uh, the uh, viscosity, we have got the thermal conductivity and then we have got the density of liquid water and ultimately we have got the Prandtl number of the liquid water. Similarly, saturated liquid properties of the condensed water on the cell side, we have got the latent heat of vaporization the latent heat of vaporization we have got sorry we have to go back to the previous slide. So, we have got latent heat of vaporization, we have got liquid viscosity, liquid thermal conductivity, liquid density and we have got uh, when the um, liquid is, the, is in the saturated condition what could be the enthalpy of the liquid. So, all these things we have got outside tube diameter and inside tube diameter we have given. Now, these two things of course, one can think of calculating, but uh, particularly the inside tube diameter one can think of calculating, but sometimes uh, it is selected in, in a practical heat, trans, heat, heat transfer equipment design or heat exchanger design many of the things are to be selected a priori uh, when you start the design. Sometimes the selected quantities we do not change, sometimes the selected quantities we change depending of, upon our preliminary result. So, here we are we have considered the inside and outside diameter of the tube. Sometimes it happens like this that these are the tubes which are generally manufactured for uh, this kind of heat exchanger. So, we have got limited selection uh, and sometimes people use or the designer use his intuition and experience for selecting certain parameter. Keeping everything floating, uh, uh, designing of a heat exchanger it becomes almost uh, impossible. Uh, if not a Herculean task. So, certain thing we have to assume or take and that these things are given. So, now let us go back to the uh, next slide. So, next slide <coughs> the cooling water velocity has been selected as 2 meter per second. This is a problem statement. Now, cooling water velocity is selected depending on two considerations. If we have got very low velocity, then we will have uh, tendency for fouling. If we have got high velocity, then we will have erosion and lesser tube life and problems of tube leakage etcetera that may be there. And again higher velocity will give higher pressure drop generally and higher pumping power. So, based on all these considerations, um, we have to um, we have to uh, select the velocity. And again I have told that the designer is an experienced one or he has got uh, good knowledge or he has got access to handbooks etcetera, codes and standards. So, from here a velocity can be picked up. Selection of velocity is very important because the inside uh, heat transfer coefficient that is also dependent on velocity. So, let us work with a velocity of 2 meter per second. Then <coughs> fouling resistance for a, a practical heat exchanger design uh, one has to consider fouling and particularly an application like this where you have to use water, water 
is a very good reactant with many kind of metallic surfaces. So, that is one thing. Another thing is that uh, there is sufficient amount of temperature uh, difference. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> heating of the tube is there uh, on one side, cooling of the tube is there on the other side. So, there will be the tubes will be prone to um, fouling on both sides, inner side and outer side. So, similarly, we have to calculate or estimate pick up the fouling resistance. So, inside and outside fouling resistances we have picked up and here also we have used tema. Tema I have uh, mentioned earlier that is it is tema is a code uh, gives many codes and standards for heat exchanger design. It is tubular exchanger manufacturers association. So, from there we have picked up and then from uh, the data etcetera which have been uh, um, supplied to you. So, we get what is the total amount of heat transfer and we get what is the coolant flow rate. So, these two are again very important information which we get from this calculation, preliminary calculation, simple calculation. With this, uh, let us uh, go back to, well, I mean let us proceed to the Next slide. Basically, we need to determine the following now. The number of tubes, length of the tubes, number of tubes and the adopted tube arrangement will help us to select the cell, cell diameter. We will discuss about it later on. So, initially we want to know that how many tubes we need to have to have this heat transfer. Rate of heat transfer has been given to us tube uh, through the tube liquid velocity we have got, liquid flow rate we have got. So, number of tubes we have to find out and then length of the tube that is also very important. So, length of the tube we have to find out. So, when we get the number of tubes and length of the tube then gradually we are moving towards the entire size of the heat exchanger, the entire size of the cell and tube heat exchanger. Though these two are the most important dimensions there are other geometrical features uh, which also need to be specified. So, this is also one thing we will gradually see what are the other features we need to specify for heat exchanger for a complete design of heat exchanger. At this point I like to mention that obviously, mechanical design we are not doing in mechanical design of heat exchangers there are many details uh, like uh, <coughs> what should be the cell thickness etcetera, why we have calculated this tube thickness, whether really this tube thickness are uh, good from mechanical design point of view or not. But the mechanical design is not within the purview of the present course. So, we will concentrate basically to thermohydraulic design, more precisely the methods of analysis to arrive at a thermohydraulic design. So, this is what we are going to do and uh, we are proceeding slowly towards that. <coughs> the number of tubes once we have got the coolant flow rate. So, uh, the, the this equation will give us the number of tubes. Okay. So, basically the number of tube we can calculate like this. For calculating the condensing side heat transfer coefficient, an estimate of average number of tube rows on a vertical column need is needed and there again comes some sort of a calculation uh, procedure that now we have got total number of tubes. The total number of tubes is quite high 13,000 tubes around 13,000 tubes. Now, how the tubes will be? how the tubes will be arranged. So, there will be rows of tubes, there will be columns of tubes. Columns of tubes, in a column how many tubes will be there that is very important. Uh, so, because uh, the heat transfer coefficient due to inundation uh, of condensate depends on how many tubes are there on a column. This we have explained in a very, in a much, in a great detail we have explained. So, here based on some consideration again we are considering that there will be 70 uh, tubes like this. 
So, like this there will be 70 tubes. So, so this is 70, this is first tube. So, on a particular column there will be 70 tubes. So, this we are considering and the coolant heat transfer coefficient h can be estimated from in tube correlation. <coughs> so, outside heat transfer coefficient we have to now determine, inside heat transfer coefficient we have to determine and how we have to determine we will see and you can see that we are fixing certain numbers, we are calculating certain numbers. So, ultimately this heat transfer coefficients we can calculate. Uh, let us go back, uh, let us go to the next slide. So, I think we have come to a, an end of uh, this lecture and uh, next lecture we will carry from this point. Thank you.